soaking its furrows and leveling its ridges. You crown the year with your goodness. Your carts overflow with plenty. The wilderness pastures overflow, and the hills are robed with joy. The pastures are clothed with flocks, and the valleys covered with grain. They shout in triumph. Indeed, they sing. Let's pray together. Father, you have blessed us so richly. God, both in material possessions, in blessings that we have such as good food and other things that you give us but father you've also given us spiritual health spiritual life and god we do this morning give you the glory because lord we know that it's only in you that we will ever receive that victory and father i pray today that that if there's anyone here who has not experienced your goodness and grace in their life and that they're still trapped by those bonds of sin, that today might be the day that they would find victory in Jesus. God, we pray that, uh, that this would just be your time as we worship together today. God, that we might be able to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And God, that we might truly join our hearts together as we praise and worship your great name today. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. If you're glad to be here this morning, would you say amen? Amen. Let's all stand, and if you would, take your church bulletin this morning. 
the words of to God, uh, give God the glory are in your church bulletin. And we're going to sing that chorus, just that first little verse again of that, because I really want y'all to learn that. We are here to give God the glory because there is victory in Jesus, which we're going to sing next. So let's sing that chorus again. Give God the glory. If you would. Give God the glory. Because we love him, 
and also because we love he loves us. I love you, Lord.
Just 
have your Bible today, I want to ask you to turn with me to Mark chapter 9. And we're going to be looking at uh, particularly verses 2 through 13 this morning. But as we look at these, these verses, I just couldn't <laughs> help but think these last uh, several songs that we have sung this morning, and especially though these last two, Through It All and, and In the Garden and Wonderful Peace, as we think about that, that those very much tied to what we're looking at today when we look at this story of the Transfiguration. And uh, that might sound a little bit odd to you, but I think as we go through the message here this morning, you'll begin to see how those things tie into all that. And uh, so if you have your Bible, I'm just going to jump right in. And last week, what we were looking at, we encountered Jesus and his disciples as uh, Jesus was giving them that message about denying self, taking up your cross, and following him. And uh, we remember, if you recall, I went ahead and read verse 1 of chapter 9 because it kind of ties to that, and it ties these two narratives together right here. And it says in verse 9, or I mean verse 1 of chapter 9, then he said to them, Truly I tell you, there are some standing here today who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God come in power. Now, when we come on to this uh, passage of Scripture we're at today, we come to this narrative about the transfiguration or the transformation. Is another way you could put that. It's recorded here in verses 2 through 13. It is a direct fulfillment of that verse that we read there in chapter 9 and verse 1. Now, and, uh, you'll see in just a second here as we get into that. And so I want us to consider this very significant event in the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we're going to make a few applications here before we get done as well this morning. So let's read the text. And uh, it says, After six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves to be alone. And he was transfigured in front of them, and his clothes became dazzling, extremely white, as no launderer on earth could whiten them. Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it's good for us to be here. Let us set up three shelters or tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he didn't know what to say, since they were terrified. A cloud appeared overshadowing them, and a voice came from the cloud, This is my beloved son. Listen to him. Suddenly looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them except Jesus. And they were coming down, or as they were coming down the mountain, he, re he ordered them not to tell anyone what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. They kept this word to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. Then he asked them, what do the scribes say, or why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Elijah does come first and restores all things, he replied. Why then is it written that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I tell you that Elijah has come, and they did whatever they pleased to him, just as it was written about him. Now, we're not going to focus quite as much on those last verses, but we want to look this morning, or what I want us to look at this morning is uh, the applications, as I said at the end, but I also want to show you two truths about the transfiguration this morning. And there is a whole lot about this that I, I'll admit to you that uh, I don't understand and I don't think most Bible scholars understand. You know, some people will say they think they've got it all figured out and things, and, and I'm going to tell you, I've really put a question mark up about some of those guys. But the first truth that I want you to see this morning, and you can follow along there in your bulletin on that outline, the first truth is that the transfiguration was a confirmation to Jesus. And so I want us to look at this. It confirmed three things in particular here this morning. First of all, it confirmed to Jesus that his suffering would be rewarded. His suffering would be rewarded. Now, I, like I said a second ago, I'm not sure exactly what happened with the transfiguration, what all took place here, <laughs> how, you know, how the, all that came about. But the word that we have that is rendered transfigured or transformed right here is the same Greek word from which we get the word metamorphosis. Now, most of us are familiar with that word. And, and uh, you know, when I was a kid, we used to watch The Incredible Hulk. You know, and when I, and, uh, so I see some of you grinning out there. You grew up in my generation. You know what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, it was Bruce Banner was his name. You know, and he'd get angry and he'd turn into the Hulk. And that was sort of a metamorphosis that he went through there. But that's all science fiction. But there are some real natural things that happen in the world where we're more familiar with. 
You know, you think about a, a butterfly. A butterfly doesn't start out as a butterfly. It starts out as an ugly caterpillar. And, uh, and then it, it spins that cocoon. And then in a few weeks, there's this beautiful butterfly that comes out of it. A tadpole is another good example of that. You know, we see a tadpole and swimming around out here in a ditch somewhere. And in a few weeks, that thing begins to grow legs and all this. And all of a sudden, it's become a frog. You know, and I can't really, I know that, that God designed them that way and, and everything, and I can't explain how all that happens, but what I know is it's a complete change that takes place in those animals like that. In the tadpole in particular, you know, it goes from being more like a fish breathing with gills to developing lungs and breathing air just like we do. And uh, so that's just a remarkable thing, but we see how that's a transformation that takes place from the inside out. And so that's what we see right here with Jesus. It was a transformation that, that complete, it was a complete and total transformation that took place in him here. It's also the same word that we have in Romans 12 too, when Paul tells us that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That there is a total transformation that is supposed to take place in our lives as we draw closer to Jesus and we get to know him Better. But in both cases, that's what it means, is to be transformed from the inside out. And so what we need to understand here is that Jesus did not just change in appearance. It was not like God put some heavenly mask on him for a minute. What we see here is that Jesus completely changed and he went into what would be his heavenly form after he went back to heaven. Now, one of the things I would say right here, some people might say, well, he went back to his heavenly form. But the reality is, once Jesus took on flesh, he never really went back to that original form that he had. Now, we know that prior to the, the New Testament, we see these uh, times where Jesus, or God incarnate, came into the world like on the night he wrestled with Jacob and, and some other things like that. And so we see how that God did appear to people in the form of a, a human, you know, and we believe that was probably Jesus in all those cases, or like when the commander of, of God's army came to, uh, to uh, Joshua and those sorts of things. But in this situation, he was shown once the, that glory that he was going to have after the resurrection. He got to taste that for just a moment. And he tasted the glory that was going to be restored to him when his work was finished. And so he confirmed, first of all here, that his suffering would be rewarded. But it also confirmed that his labor was recognized. He confirmed that his labor was recognized throughout Jesus' ministry. And this is where that the song, one of the particularly through it all and even in the garden, really kind of connect with this here. Throughout his ministry, Jesus dealt with heartache. I mean, he, he went through some trials. He went through some really tough times in his ministry. You think about it. The disciples never did quite get it until the resurrection. I mean, they didn't really comprehend everything that was going on. And even then, it took them 40 days to get them straightened out, you know. And uh, he hung around with them for 40 days after the resurrection to get them on track there after all that. So they never did quite get it. The Pharisees and the teachers of the, of the law, the people that should have recognized who he was, they wanted to put him to death. They weren't really understanding everything there was to know about Jesus. Listen to this. His own mother and his brothers thought he was crazy. They can't, went to get him. They said, he is out of his mind. We've got to bring that boy back home and get him back on the right track here. And they didn't understand that they were the ones that were on the wrong track and all that. And even John the Baptist, you know, Jesus makes that reference right there at the end of, of the passage that we read there a minute about how Elijah had come. He's referring to John the Baptist right there. And so even John the Baptist, who was the forerunner of the Messiah, had some doubts. He sent his disciples to Jesus and he said, are you really the one that's supposed to come? And, and so we see that Jesus dealt with heartache along the way. And so this appearance of Moses and Elijah was an assurance to Jesus that even if no one else noticed, all of heaven was cheering him on. You know, when we look at this, this passage and what we kind of get to, we're probably going to have to skip over a few chapters here and get closer to the, uh, to the crucifixion and the resurrection with Easter coming up soon and, and all that. But when you look at this, Jesus was approaching the most difficult days of his ministry. When we come to this point right here, he is definitely within about six months of the cross right here. And so he's approaching the most 
uh, difficult days of his ministry. He was going to be going to Jerusalem where he would put, be put on trial and subsequently executed. And yet he had no counselor to talk with. I think that's one of the things that we don't comprehend sometimes. Jesus had no peers in this world. I mean, we all have people that we can go talk to. You know, I've got lots of friends that are also pastors. And when I'm dealing with a struggle or a trial or something like that about uh, different things, I can go and talk with them. You know people that maybe work in your field or, or something like that. Or you've got friends and family members and people that, that they can relate to where you are and what you're going through. They may not know just exactly, but you can go and talk to people. Jesus didn't have peers like that. He didn't have people that he could go and talk with. Nor did he have anyone who could really relate to what was about to happen to him. Only God the Father knew that. Only those in heaven like Moses and Elijah that we read about here really understood all that was at stake here. And so this appearance of those two great men would be an encouragement to Jesus. You know, you think about the, the role that Moses played, which is also the role that Jesus played there. Moses had been a mediator between God's people and God during the days of the Exodus. Elijah had experienced persecution just like Jesus had for fulfilling the commands of God. You think about it, Elijah, one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament there, won one of the greatest victories ever won. You know, he's saying victory in Jesus, but um, he had quite a victory up there on Mount Carmel when he went up against all these 850 prophets of Asher and Baal. And so that, that was the situation. He, he had this great victory when God rained fire down from heaven. But immediately after that, you know, Jezebel says, listen, <clears throat> by this time tomorrow, I'm going to make you just like one of them. And he took off and ran and went down to, to Sinai and hid out in the, in the wilderness there. And so he had experienced persecution. He understood those things. And so these two men, more than anyone else, could really relate to what Jesus was feeling during this moment. But another thing that the transfiguration confirmed to Jesus was his father's love. It revealed his, his father's love to him. Now listen to me. Now this is not a Father's Day message, but it would be a good one right here on this. Now I want you to listen to me carefully. There is nothing in the world that any son desires more than to have his father's approval. Now, that is, that is the truth. I can tell you that as a, both a father and a son. And any man sitting in this, this uh, room or, or watching at home, wherever they might be, if they're really honest, they'll tell you the same thing. As much as anything in the world, that's what boys and men want. They want to have their father's approval. But the sad reality is most men have a difficult time of expressing their love to their sons. And they often do things, you know, men will do things, and we're all guilty of this, we'll do things for our children, for our sons in particular. And, and our sons and even our daughters, they may know deep down in their hearts that they're loved by their dads, but sometimes people just need to hear those words, son, I love you, and I'm proud of you. I'm going to tell you, I, I have all the things that my dad has ever said to me, those words right there are the ones that mean the most. I don't remember who it was. He was talking to somebody one day, and I was there and, and everything, and he was expressing to them how proud he was of me and my brothers about what we'd accomplished in life and what we were doing and all that. That's what men really need to hear. That's what boys really need to hear from their fathers. And so sometimes we just need to hear the words, though. And in a sense, that's exactly what's happening with Jesus in this situation right here. Now, I can tell you for sure that there was never a time in Jesus' life when he doubted his father's love. You know, he was he's one with the father. He said he always knew that he was loved by the father. But this was one of those times when he really needed to hear those words. And in all three synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he expressed his love for his son. He said, this is my beloved son, or this is my son whom I love. You know, in every one of them, he says that. But in Matthew, he adds that phrase, with him, I am well pleased. In other words, the father was saying to Jesus, 
You have done everything perfectly, exactly like I wanted you to do it. And I trust that you're going to continue doing things in the same manner. And so the, the, uh, the transfiguration was a confirmation. But it's also the second truth that we're going to see here is that the transfiguration was a revelation. The transformation or the trans well, the transformation or the transfiguration was a revelation. And the first thing it revealed was that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. That he was the Messiah. The appearance of Moses and Elijah with Jesus showed that it was not or that he was not a reincarnation of either of those. You remember what Jesus asked the disciples back just a, a little ways back? He said, Who do people say that I am? And they said, Some say that you're Moses or Elijah, some say you're John the Baptist and, or one of the other prophets, you know, and all that. And so there were a lot of people that thought, well, you know, he's just a reincarnation of these guys come back into the world. But that was not the case. To the Jews, Moses and Elijah had, in many ways, been the two greatest men who ever lived. Now think about some other men that we think about were great men of God. Enoch walked with God. Noah was blameless before God, is what the scripture says. Abraham is called a friend of God. David, it says, was a man after God's own heart. Solomon possessed the greatest wisdom, and Isaiah is sometimes called the prince of prophets. But only Moses and Elijah ever beheld the glory of God. They are the only two men in the Old Testament that we read about that really saw God's glory. You remember Moses was up there and he said, Lord, show me your glory. And God said to him, Moses, you can't look on my face and live, but I am going to reveal my glory to you. I'm going to pass by. I'm going to declare my name. I'm going to reveal my glory. And I'm going to hide you over here in the, in the cleft of the rock. And as I pass by, I will remove my hand from in front of your face and you'll be able to see my glory as it comes by. Now, Elijah had a kind of similar experience, but very different, too. You remember when he went and hid in that cave down there, God came and appeared to Elijah. <clears throat> and uh, at first of all, there was a, a great fire, and then there was a whirlwind, you know. But then there was that still, small voice that appeared to Elijah. Now, Elijah had seen God's glory when he brought fire down from heaven. But in that moment, it was a very intimate time where God revealed his glory to Elijah in a very unique and special way. And so each of these men had had an experience with God unlike anybody else who had ever lived. And it was these two men that appeared with Jesus. Now every, every Jew knew that the Messiah was going to come and fulfill the law of Moses. And they knew that Elijah was the prophet who was to come and precede the Messiah. But what I want you to note here is that the appearance of these two men of God was overshadowed by an announcement from God himself. It says that cloud overshadowed them and the father said, this is my beloved son. Luke records in his gospel that God also said that he was the chosen one. Now, if there had been any doubt in Peter, James, and John's minds up to that time that Jesus was the Messiah, then this appearance and announcement should have quelled any of those doubts. Now, but what we know is that it didn't fully fulfill everything for them then. But the transfiguration also here revealed the misunderstanding that many had regarding the Messiah's suffering. So it revealed that he was the Messiah, but it also revealed a misunderstanding. Peter's offer right here, he said, Lord, or teacher is what he says. He says, Rabbi, teacher. He offered, he said, let me build three tents. Let me build three tabernacles, shelters for you, for Moses and Elijah. And, and friends, what that does is that he, it shows, first of all, that Peter saw them on an even plane. He didn't understand that Jesus actually stands head and shoulders above these other two guys here. He said, let's build a tabernacle for each of you. Listen, in the wilderness, how many tabernacles were there? One. And it was the place where God came down to dwell with his people. But Peter's offering to build three tabernacles here. But by addressing Jesus in this context as teacher, he also showed that he did not understand that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. But the most interesting thing here is, like I said, that he offered to build three tabernacles. 
Now, friends, well, like I said a second ago, the tabernacle had been that place where God came down to the people of Israel. And it was a symbol of his presence with his people. And Peter, what he wanted to do is just hold on to this moment in time. He didn't want to lose the moment. I'm about to lose this microphone, though. I'll tell you what. And on. Okay, turn this thing on. This thing's driving me crazy. I'm on. <laughs> we'll go the regular way. But as they were heading down the garden, after all, I, I got to back up. I got myself all messed up here. Yes, sir. Peter wanted to hold on to that moment. He did not want to lose the moment that he was in right there. And after all he had seen and all that Jesus had taught, he still had not understood that there could not be salvation without suffering. There was no way for God to affect salvation in the world without Jesus suffering death on the cross. And so what Peter wanted was to experience the crown without the cross. And friends, that's where so many people are today. You know, Jesus had just given that teaching about if anyone wants to come after me, he's got to deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. If you are going to be a follower of Jesus, there is a cross you must bear. Now, it's not Jesus' cross, but you have a cross that you must bear. We talked about that last week. But that's what Peter wanted. He wanted to experience the crown without the cross. And so as they were heading back down the mountain, Jesus told the disciples, he said, look, guys, y'all keep all this to yourselves until after I have risen from the dead. And friends, let me tell you something. One cannot be risen from the dead if he has not died. That is just a given right there. And then Jesus asked Peter, James, and John that rhetorical question. He said, basically, Elijah comes and restores everything. How then is it written about the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt? So you see, friends, the transfiguration revealed that Jesus was not just the Messiah, but that he was indeed the suffering Messiah who would pay the ultimate price not for his own sin, but for our sin. So the transfiguration, the transfiguration was a confirmation and a revelation, but I also want to show you that the transfiguration has some application. So let's talk about those right quick. And essentially, the first one is this. It's the same thing that we saw last week. That we must press on in the ministry that God has given us. Whatever God has called you to do, you must press on in it. And let me say this. There is nothing harder in this world than standing all alone, especially when you know you are right. We have flipped things on its head according to uh, the way the world thinks today. We think that whoever has the majority opinion, regardless of what that opinion is, and who has the loudest voice is the one that's right. Well, listen, what's the old saying say? Might does not make right. And that's the, the case here. And you know, that's the thing. Jesus was standing all alone against the entire world, against the forces of Satan, and all that in this time. And friends, listen to me. There are going to be times in your life as a believer when you are going to want to give up. It seems like it, it's going to seem like it is you against the world. And you may feel like no one understands what you're going through. And you might even experience rejection by others. And in those moments, you've got to remember you are not alone. No one has ever experienced those emotions more fully than Jesus did. And just as he was reminded by Moses and Elijah and his father, we've got to remember that the host of heaven is cheering us on in our respective ministries, whatever that might be. Always remember those words of Hebrews 12, 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised the shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. And I know I have referenced this before, but I'm going to tell you something. We read about Jesus going and sitting down, sitting down at the right hand of the Father. And you know what he says to the church in Laodicea? 
Not just that I wish you were cold or hot, but that the one who overcomes, I will allow him to come and sit down with me on my throne. Amen. Listen, we have been given all the promises that God has given to his son here. Jesus said that. He said, listen, all the things you see me doing, you'll do even greater things. Because we have the Holy Spirit dwelling with us and we have numbers that Jesus didn't have. We can accomplish so much. But we've got to remember we are not alone. And you've got to remember that God cares <coughs> and others don't seem to care. It may be that you just need to get along with God for a little bit. You know, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up this mountain so that they could be with him for just a little bit. You know, we, Debbie sang that beautiful song in the garden, and that's what we kind of think about, about going and taking a walk with, with Jesus out here. Now, I can remember hearing that song when I was just a little bitty boy, and that's what the image that I would get in my mind, is just being out there walking through, and I, and, I, and I was smart enough to know it wasn't talking about walking through my daddy's vegetable garden. That wasn't the idea, but walking through a beautiful garden, you know, with, with Jesus, kind of like walking through the Garden of Eden or, or something like that. And sometimes we just need to get alone with Jesus. Sometimes we need to take that advice that Henry Blackaby said. You know, I, I, I think I said this one a few weeks ago as well. Henry Blackaby said, you know, we often hear that expression, don't just stand there, do something. He said, sometimes God is looking at us and saying, don't just do something, stand there. In other words, just be still and know that I am God. Be still in his presence for a few moments and listen to what he's saying to you. And so you maybe need to get along with God for a little bit. It might be, or it's been my experience that in those times when I feel most alone or that I feel that I'm failing at, at what I know God's called me to do, <clears throat> that that's when God sends someone my way with a word of encouragement. Or maybe I open God's Word and I find that passage of Scripture that just speaks perfectly to what I'm experiencing. Or it might be that I, I hear a sermon that, that somebody preaches and it just speaks into my, my heart and my life. And through all of that, God says, Remember, <coughs> you are my son. I love you. And I'm proud of you. Or maybe you are my daughter. I love you. And I'm proud of you. Now, another thing we've got to remember in all this, another application we've got to make here, and as Kelly was singing through it all, that second verse says, I thank God for the mountains, but also thank Him for the valleys. Listen, listen to you. This is a tough one. The next application is, is that you can stay on the mountaintop. You cannot live on the mountaintop. Just like Peter, many of us have experienced those wonderful times with God when he revealed himself to us in a powerful way. And we love those experiences. We crave those experiences. And friends, we don't forget those experiences when they happen like that. But we have to remember that life happens down in the valley. The trek through the valley is what makes us appreciate the mountaintops. And we've got to remember that the trail to the mountaintop, it might have a few little dips along the way, but to get to the mountaintop, it's an uphill climb. And, and something else that, that I can tell you for sure that I've observed, I made reference to my dad's vegetable garden a minute ago, not a whole lot grows up on the mountaintops. Now, now, not necessarily like the Smoky Mountains up here in, in uh, you know, you can go up on top of them and you can find a little dirt to plant something, you know, here or there. But it's mostly rock even there. But um, if you ever go out west, like Pikes Peak, someplace like that, there's nothing growing up on those places. You go up on those mountaintops, there might be a little snow, but there's not much growing up there. And you can't stay up there very long. you got to come down. And, and things grow down in the, the valley. We grow when we're down in the valley. Yes, we may feel closer to God when we're on the mountaintop. And we may be able to momentarily forget the things of this world when we're up on the mountaintop. But we've got to remember that our ministry is in the world, down in the valley, and not up on the mountaintop. 
One other application here, and I'm going to finish up with this one. We must proclaim the full gospel of Jesus Christ. And I'm not talking about the full gospel like the charismatic movement would push on you. There are many people today who, just as I said a few moments ago about Peter, would run right past the cross of Christ. And you can't have it that way. You cannot have the crown without the cross. And a lot of people today are just like Peter and they are dreaming of those crowns when they should be focusing on the cross. Because friends, it's the, the cross, it's the, the death of Jesus on that cross that saves. That's what we have to remember. That's where our sin was atoned for, was on the cross. And so we have to preach the cross. We have to live in light of the cross. Because one day we will experience the resurrection. But people cannot have a resurrection. They cannot be raised to new life in Christ until they have died to their old way of living. And that is what repentance and faith are all about right there. Is dying to self, taking up that cross, and following Jesus. Remember what Jesus said. And I'll close this verse in John 16, 33. I have told you these things so that in me, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much today for your word, and I thank you for the wonderful message of the gospel that it contains. And God, I pray today that if there is anyone here who's never placed their faith in Jesus, that today would be the day they would say, Lord, I recognize that you are the Messiah who suffered in my place, who gave his all so that I might have eternal life in him. And Lord, I pray that, that that person would come to you today saying, Lord, I, I have made a mess of my life. I've sinned, I've fallen short of your glory, and today I just want to lay all that stuff down at the foot of the cross. And I want to cling to Jesus from this day forward. God, I pray that if, if there's anyone here who would pray a prayer like that, that you give them courage in just a moment as we have this time of invitation to just step out from where they are and to come down and to share that with our church today. Father, I pray for those that might be here who need to come and unite with our church and become a, a member of the Daphne Baptist Church. But Father, I pray most of all today for those of us, because most of us are your followers, most of us are disciples of Christ. But God, we're not always living the way we should. Sometimes we're running past the cross, striving for the crown. Sometimes we're wanting to camp out on the, on the mountaintop. But Lord, I pray that we would stay in the fight, that we would stay down in the valley, and that we would do what it takes to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray today that if there's anyone here who just needs to come and, and repent of some things at this altar, that they come. God, we love you. We thank you for this opportunity, and I pray your Holy Spirit would just move among us right now, and that we might carry out the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lifetime, in our community, and in our world. We pray these things today in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you hear the invitation that's being played right now. What's that hymn number? Hymn number 480. 480. If you need the hymnal, you can get that. We're going to sing only trust him. If you need to come trusting Jesus today, you come during this time of invitation. We're going to stand right now and say you come as soon as we begin to sing. Come every soul I sin and oppress, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him. Only trust Him now, oh, He will save you, He 
will save you. He will save you now. I'm going to ask Paula and Ron if they just continue to play, and Becky, if they just continue to play softly over there for one more stanza this morning. Friend, if you need to come and you need to give your life to Christ, you come right now as we continue to, say, to sing and, and to uh, play this. Friend, it, it's an important, important decision. And so if you need to come today, you come. Thank you for being here today. It's been a wonderful day to be in God's house. Great time of worship, and, and uh, I hope you enjoy your afternoon. I think we got going to have a beautiful, beautiful day today. And uh, so make sure you greet some of the folks around you. I know we had a couple of folks who came in late this morning, and um, so make sure you speak to everybody before you get away. But again, good to see everyone, and uh, have a wonderful afternoon. Arthur, it's good to have you back with us today. Would you lead us in our closing prayer? Everybody, we do thank you.